Okay, awesome guys. So thank you guys so much for coming to the ADR Intra Team Finals for 2022. Um, we're gonna get started. We've got our two teams. We've got Team A, we've got Libby and Ananya, and Team D, we have Autumn and Amber. Uh, we also have their coaches, Felicia Harris-Haas and Colin Robinson are present. We also have people in the Zoom world. Um, for judges, we have Danielle Giaccio, uh, who is virtual right now. We also have Madison Hastings, and then I'm Megan DH. So the teams today are going to have 60 minutes. Both sides gets a five minute break or up to a five minute break if you'd like to take it. And at the end of the 60 minutes, you'll have 10 minutes uh, to prepare for self-evaluations. Um, since you guys are lower in the alphabet, you guys will go first for your self-evaluations and you'll have 10 minutes. And then you guys will go second and you'll have 10 minutes. And then we will announce winners. Um, great. Well, congratulations. No matter what I'm being here today, though, this is awesome. So, in, you know, we want to commend your coaches. Thank you so much for your time and the work that you've put into this. Um, again, can everybody in Zoom world hear us okay? Yes. Awesome. Perfect. Thanks, Danielle. Great. Well, we'll go ahead. If you guys do have your own timers, um, feel free to use your own timer. You can use a phone. It just needs to be in airplane mode. And yes, the call. I will shut the door. It's being streamed live um, on YouTube and it will be on Blakely's website. Um, for anybody who wants to join us, you can join right now. Don't worry. <laughs> there are going to be a lot of people going to the Blakely site to watch this, I don't think. Um, but either way, they should because they will learn a lot. Um, so I'm sure it would be helpful for them. Um, if anyone needs anything, I also recognize it's a little hot in here. So if you need to do something or if you need to take a, a break, just in addition to your normal break to like cool off or something, that's totally okay. So we will get started whenever you're all ready. All right, let's see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Three, two, one. Go. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Good morning. Hi. 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 Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate the time that Mr. Fagan has taken to both meet with Mr. Madron ahead of time and also uh, to be here today to work out all the details of their agreement. Um, so with that, we're just going to tell you a little bit about Mr. Madron and Home Love and then I'll uh, talk a little bit about the specific goals that we have from our conversation today. Yeah. Again, thank you guys so much for being here. As Ananya mentioned, we're here on behalf of Home Love Limited and its CEO, Tony Macron. Um, so just a little bit about Home Love. Um, as you guys know, it's an online platform where people can put their homes up for rental. So it's you know either individual homeowners or commercial. They can put up a whole apartment, a house, or even just a room that they have. Um, and, you know, recently in the news, there's been a lot of refugees coming from war-torn countries to European countries looking for a safe and stable place to live. So Mr. Madron felt led and called to not just sit idle and see this go by. He wanted to create a home away from home for these refugees. Um, you know, Moldova is a high-demand city for these refugees. A lot of them are fleeing there. And that's what led him to reach out to your client, Mr. Fagan. He knows that he's got a lot of properties in the area. And he wanted to discuss the possibility of renting these out, or not renting, excuse me, you know, having him volunteer these properties or even subsidize some of them. Um, I know our clients met, had a very productive conversation over coffee, um, where they agreed towards the goal of, you know, maximizing the housing that would be available for these refugees. You know, there's not very many people out there like Mr. Fagan who have the kindness of their hearts to volunteer their properties, um, you know, knowing they would be giving up profits. But we really appreciate him sharing that mission to create a home away from home. And we're excited to work with you guys today. Um, without going into too many details, I'll turn it over to Ananya to let her explain our interests for today's negotiations. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Libby. So also, just to let y'all know, we do have full authorization to agree to any agreement that we come to today. Um, and if for some reason we, you know, talk about a point that we don't, like, have the authorization from Mr. John, we can obviously take that point back to him and pin it for next time. Um, so with that, our specific goals are maximizing units really quickly. Should we write them over there so that people can yes. see? Yes, good idea. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. 
Perfect, thanks. So maximizing units, um, maximizing duration, and maximizing goodwill. And I'll give Libby a second to get that all up there, and I can talk a little bit about what each of those means. Okay, so with maximizing units, um, our goal here, one of them is to have as many refugees in sheltered homes as possible. Um, our second for maximizing duration, that's for providing migrating families with the maximum amount of stability that we can offer them. Um, and then for third, for maximizing goodwill, this is just so more um, people such as Mr. Fagan open up their listings and more families have a place to stay. So with that, um, we were wondering if you could share a little bit more about why Mr. Fagan wants to volunteer his units. Thank you so much. I'm capturing that question. I want to make sure that we circle back and answer it for you. We'd like to provide some context that might be helpful in progressing this negotiation forward. One, I love these types of negotiations because it means our clients have already done most of the work. They have already agreed that a potential agreement is possible. And it seems like we're just here at the table sort of seeing if the numbers can be possible so that both parties can leave. Um, we are also here authorized to make a deal. The context that might be helpful for that is that the properties are owned by EF Management and Elias Fagan, our client, owns that company. So the good news is whatever units or whatever agreement we come to, it means that we won't have to come back and say, uh, just kidding, this other entity that actually owns some of the property is disagreeing with us on that. So we are authorized to make a deal and we do have full control over the properties that are subject to this deal. So that's some good news that we think is in line with the interests that you all have. Um, we're really happy that most of the work has already been done. And I will say right now, it looks like our interests aligned. It does look like exactly what Amber and I were speaking about. It does look like this really is just a numbers conversation. And in case I didn't say by way of introduction, I know we shook hands earlier. My name is Autumn Brehan. This is my partner, Amber Keating. We usually are property lawyers and contract lawyers. We never really get the opportunity to do these types of philanthropic endeavors. So we're happy our clients have put us at the table to sort of see if we can make something happen today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Amber to briefly explain our interests, and then we'll see if we can get back to this conversation of why volunteering. Yeah, just again, it's good to see you guys. And this is such a great um, topic for us to be discussing today. Um, our interests are uh, seemingly very much so aligned. Um, we really have four things that we want to talk about um, for our two interests, which are a reasonable approach uh, and a sustainable solution. Um, under those two interests, we want to discuss um, subsidizing the housing uh, and the volunteer housing, um, avoiding property damage as best we can and mitigating that. Uh, the properties themselves in terms of what types of properties um, will be uh, given to the refugees to stay in for uh, the short term and the duration of how long the refugees are going to be there. Uh, these are things that we do need numbers on and we're we're pretty sure that uh, this is going to be a very productive conversation in that regard. Sorry, I'm sort of capturing some of that back here. Sort of building it on your interests, I think you guys have framed this conversation really well. Just to make sure we're maximizing the units, we're going to add that subsidy of property damage there. We already have the duration and length of time. And then I think the maximizing the well is something we're really interested in and learning a little more about. Yes, so thanks for giving me the opportunity to sort of write that down. Yeah, it's kind of, it's really great to hear that we have aligned interests. Like you said, this is, uh, it's good when our clients are on the same page and that seems like where we are today. So I'm very excited to, you know, hand out these terms and hopefully have a good deal to take back to our clients Saturday on us. Yeah, so I think back to the question you initially asked, why volunteer? I think, like I said, we're usually the property lawyers or the contract lawyers, and sometimes our clients, our, our clients specifically are so focused on the business end of things that even when they see a problem, they're not sure how they can be part of the solution. And so when your client reached out to Elias Fagan, it was a, a, almost an epiphany for our client and realizing, actually, I do have the capacity to do some goodwill. And so I hope that, you know, lends you guys at least the clarity of knowing he's still excited. He's still happy about the conversation. He feels very privileged to be a part of this solution. And so I, I think for us, it might make sense to start actually with the subsidy. I know that it sounds sometimes a little hard to start with a number, 
and we know that our clients is very business oriented, but we do know once we can get that subsidy number on the table, then we can really start talking about maximizing that number of units that you all are interested in and then getting into length of time. We didn't want to do something where we started, for example, with the number of units, but then as the subsidy numbers change, we had to go back and go back on things that we maybe agreed to in principle. So if it's okay with you all, can we start with the subsidy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you all talk to us a little bit about what your client has shared in terms of how the subsidy can look for these properties? Yeah, I can definitely get into that. So just before answering that so that we know, so currently there's obviously a lot of huge number of properties. You know, with the subsidy conversation, are all of those pro are all of those properties up for it, or is it like you know only half the properties available? When you say all or half, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I was, what number? Um, okay, so I mean like the the like number of units that probably should have been up earlier. But and just so you know, we're referencing a chart that Mr. Megan sent mm -hmm. over to us the other day. So these are just the number of properties that he does own. Right. So I, I don't know that I could say 100% of the units are available. He does still have, of course, to, to sell to the, the renters, the tourists who are coming in town, who also might be there to, for example, do good work, other philanthropic endeavors. So I, I would say based on this, like just to start, I would say 100% of everything on this list isn't available for okay. subsidy. It's just what he owns. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so are these not all the ones that he owns? Because I think we were under the impression that this is the complete list. Um, of all the properties that he owns. I think they are. Okay. okay. They're okay. just not, but all of those properties are not available necessarily for subsidization or, or volunteering. Okay. Right. That um, makes sense. Do you have kind of a number on those? Like, I think the reason that I'm, that we want to find this information out is just so we know, like, what the total number of properties we're working with, because that relates to the subsidizing question. Because mm -hmm. let's say if we're talking about five properties, right, then there's N number of subsidies. If we're talking about 10 properties, and it's to an amount of subsidies. So I think that's yeah. the kind of question. It sounds like we're at a really weird impasse because our number of properties is contingent on the subsidy, but your number of subsidies is contingent on the property. So it sounds like we're at a weird impasse in terms of how to maybe move forward. Amber, what do you thinking is the best way to maybe all meet so that we can all feel like we're starting somewhere productive? Um, I think that um, it would be better for us to lay out the maximum number of properties without the contextualization of the subsidy versus volunteer housing. Okay. Because for our client, there's sort of a proportional um, basis for subsidized and volunteer. The maximum number of properties that we could offer you would be eight. Eight. That's the, the most, but that is not with the context of subsidized versus um, okay. unsubsidized. So that would mean essentially that, let's just throw random numbers out there, that this is like real, it's just so that I understand it, let's say, you know, maybe five are volunteer and three are subsidized. Is that correct? Yes, and that number would shift depending right. on, on our conversation. Yes, and yes exactly. so To make sure that I added it up, it's 21 total properties. We're not talking about all 21. We're only talking about eight today. Yes. Okay, um, and that's really great to hear because, you know, our goal today is just to maximize the housing for the greatest number of people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are people who have already lost their stability once when they had to flee. So we're looking at providing, you know, hopefully longer term housing for people, just a stable environment, again, creating that home away from home. Um, so I'm just interested, maybe we could talk about the duration of the stay for these properties. Um, how long is Mr. Fagan wanting to allow these properties to be like either volunteer or subsidized for? Well, let me ask the question because I want to make sure we're honoring what our client said mm -hmm. and what your client talked to when they met for coffee. Mm -hmm. We understand that when they met for coffee, they talked about short-term housing. How did your client interpret that? Like, how did your client define short-term in that conversation in that moment? I think that the ideal would be one year, um, but we know that might not be possible based on the size of the property, um, just different factors regarding availability, which is um, kind of what we were hoping to find out today. Um, so we're really interested in these larger housing units, you know, the four bedroom houses, the three bedroom houses, because again, a lot of people, when they are refugees, they come as a family unit or they come with their neighbors. So to maximize that amount of people that we can provide that stable housing for, we're really interested in these larger properties. So could you just give us a little more information on the availability of those for either volunteering or subsidizing? 
Yes, but I'm, I'm going to acknowledge I'm getting a little lost in the conversation. I know we initially said we would sort of start with subsidy, but then it sounded like we moved to the number of units. Then it sounded like we're moving to length of time. And so I just want to make sure I fully understand exactly where the conversation is going. I guess I want to nest a little bit in one of these for a certain amount of time. So I'd like to go back to the duration because it sounds like that was something we were interested in. Um, our client did understand short term as less than a year, but it does sound like your client is amenable to that. Then maybe there just needs to be some discussion on the types of units. Is that how I'm understanding it? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So obviously for the larger housing units, we would hope to provide longer term. And by when I say long term, I'm thinking like a year or maybe 10 months. Uh, is that something that your client would be able to do since we're discussing length of duration? Um, so as long as it's under a, a one year limit, our client has a fairly, um, a fairly positive um, relationship with what you guys are saying. Um, for the larger units, those units, um, just from a, a general standpoint, produce more money for our client. Mm -hmm. So there is an interest in having those units be um, utilized to the best of their capacity um, from his general business standpoint and also for this mm -hmm. endeavor as well. Um, Sorry, I should say. <laughs> um, I think that the, the larger number housing, 10 months sounds like a very reasonable number for the large, um, the larger number of units. Um, I am interested in how many of those larger units your client wants, because it sounds like he's very interested in keeping families together, groups who have come with each other together. What is the number of larger units your client is interested in having? Yeah, I can take that one. So from the math that we did, and again, I know we touched on it a little bit. There are eight properties available. I think we're a little unclear on which exactly are those eight properties, but it looks like the four bedroom house has three units. The three bedroom house has two units. The two bedroom two play duplex has two units. If someone knows the exact pronunciation, point, duplex. Great. Uh, my French letter did not help me right there. Um, and then the three bedroom duplex has the one unit, which brings us up to eight properties. If those are the eight that we're talking about, we would love those. Um, if, for example, you know, of the original eight that we were talking about, um, four of those fit within the four bedroom and three bedroom, then that's great. But one of our priorities here is to aim for those um, larger occupancy units. Okay, so let me provide some context in how our client's looking at it. We're looking purely at the occupancy numbers. That's okay. sort of how we've been provided that information. So for us, it's not purely based on the housing type, it's based on the occupancy number. And so for us, the higher occupancy numbers, like she said, I'm sure you all know this, but the country that we're in, it's a really large tourist destination. And while it does make sense that some of those sites are best for large families to stay together, we also believe based on the research that we've done that even with some of those, we can still keep families together. The good thing about the properties that EF management holds is that they're all within that 15 mile radius of each other. And so maybe you're, that might not be something that your client has that working knowledge of, but families would be less than 15 miles apart, even if they were in some of our smaller units. The good news is we can offer more of the smaller units. And so if we're trying to get more families together, being 15 miles apart is much better than being in different countries because that's where the housing is big. I know I just threw a lot of information at you. No, that totally makes sense. I just want to recap that I got all of it out, um, that I got, I understood all of that. So it's um, smaller units equals more units, and larger units equals maybe not so many units. Is that a little bit of it? In principle, yeah. yes. Again, all of this is contingent again on that subsidy. I don't want to agree to something in principle, and then you feel like we walked back on our word. But in, yeah, in short. Totally makes sense. So I think you brought up the subsidy conversation earlier. Um, I just want to understand, so how does that play with the occupants that you just mentioned? Can you say a little bit more about your question? Yeah, so like, um, would, would any of these units be available if they were to be subsidized? Or are any of these units available to be volunteered? Because what, what I'm understanding right now is these four types of units that we talked about are not up for volunteering but maybe could be up to be subsidized. Is that correct? 
every use, sorry. Amber. When you say four types, are what are you referring to? Those were the, the four bedroom house, the three bedroom house, the two bedroom duplex, and the what, the three the two bedroom and the three bedroom duplex. I can also go by occupancy. So that's yeah. the eight person, the six person, the eight, and the twelve. Okay, so in short, thank you for clarifying, because I, I want to just be honest, our information from our client is, he's really thinking in occupancy, he's not thinking in type, and so when you guys are talking about type, I'm like, wait, that's, he's thinking only in occupancy. So, yes, anything technically is up for pure volunteer or pure subsidy. Okay. It really, great. these are like sliding scales where things move depending on what's on the table. Right. Okay. That's good to hear because also coming into this, we had in mind that whatever properties would be used, it would be a combination of the two. Okay. So I guess it's just finding that happy medium for Mr. Fagan, um, just to see how many we can volunteer versus how many we can subsidy, which is why I think we keep kind of circling back to that because that will dictate a lot of the other terms like link, um, things like that. Which just to ask the question, mm -hmm. um, I think that with these sorts of problems, mm -hmm. I've always found just like back to high school days with math generally, if you anchor the, the circumstance to a particular thing that you can narrow down, you can sort of launch what you're talking about from that point. Right. So I, I am curious about how many specifically, if you have a number, larger occupancy uh, units your client is interested in because from there we can sort of mm -hmm. do the proportional increase and decrease of the volunteer and subsidize. So do you have a number for how many larger um, occupancy houses you like? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we have like a very specific number in mind. The more the better. You know, okay. that's okay. what our client had told us going in okay. because again, like they had discussed at their coffee talk, it's just the more housing, the better. They just want to create that home away from home where people can be stable, as many people as possible. Okay. Um, okay. We know that your client has room for 100 people if, like, theoretically, all of the housing was used. You know, just the more people we can help, the better. The better. Let's do this. Let's start with that number you all initially, we initially shared with, like, the maximum eight. Mm -hmm. Let's just put the number eight on the board and yeah. start from, you want to write that down? Let's just get the eight on the board and start with that variable sort of control. I think that's a great, yeah. great idea. That way, because I, I know that, you know, our clients pay for an hour. I want to make sure we can get back to them with some numbers. So let's start with that eight total units. We can tell you right now, with the eight total units, mm -hmm. you're going to be looking at less larger size occupancy property. Okay. When you say less, could you give us a ballpark range of how many of the larger occupancy units he would be willing to volunteer? Yeah, for something like eight total units, he would probably want them all to be the smaller size units. And when you say smaller size, what do you see? I was just going to say, I think that there's also, our client does this for a living. You know, he thinks about units of occupancy. Mm -hmm. And I think that Mr. Madron might not be um, of that same sort of thinking process. When we say larger unit versus smaller unit we're pretty much talking you have this chart kind of right, right. Mm -hmm. okay pretty much we're talking about anything four and below for in terms of occupancy limit per unit okay. four and below um, is the smaller scale unit uh, anything six and above is what we're talking about when we say larger occupancy unit just to add some clarification um a clarifying question i have what about the duplex since it's four for each side, do you consider that a smaller or a larger unit? Like the two, the two bedroom duplex, the three bedroom duplex. Yes. Sir. Um, I'm not. I, I don't want to hide the ball from you. I'm not sure that our the information we have from our client breaks it down in that way, so that I can give you an honest answer. Okay. Um, I. I, that's something maybe we can go back and clarify. We come to an agreement in principle. I will say what Amber said is I think probably the best clarity we can give you is that in his brain four people or below is a smaller unit and six people or above is a larger. But I think it's a fair question that could really change the scope of how we pick the certain properties to go back and say, hey, we came up with an agreement. What about these duplexes? Okay, yeah, perfect. Um, and maybe for the sake of clarity, since it's four for each side and they're you know separate units, mm -hmm. we can just consider it a smaller unit for the purpose of this discussion. Yes, and I then just thinking of that. you can a... clarify it with your client after this big meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, it sounds like we just sort of set a definition in stone. Can, can you say that to me one more time? Yes, ma'am. So I was saying since it's four for each side, we'll categorize the duplex as a smaller unit. And that's the two the two bedroom duplex? Yes. 
Yes. I don't know that that, as I'm taking it, Amber, what are your thoughts on this? I don't know that that I think maybe that, is how our client might interpret that. Yeah, I think that we might need to, um, if it's all right with you guys, maybe take the duplexes off the table for today, just in the sense that we would need to talk to our client about what his perception of the occupancy of the duplexes is, because both of them are in total um, higher occupancy units based okay. on the six or more, but individually, we're not sure how he counts them. Okay, so we're taking all the duplexes off the table today? At least in principle, because I still think we can reach those eight units you all were interested in if we're adding up some of the other units like towards the bottom, like there are seven units of the one bedroom. And so I think we can like we can definitely still reach the eight units you all were interested in. Yeah. But I can see that there's maybe a reaction. Are is your client specifically interested in a type of property? Um, no, I believe we're also looking at the occupancy, okay. wanting okay. a higher occupancy. Okay. I do hate to see that go because that's uh, you know 16 for the two bedroom and then there's 12. That's a lot of you know possible well, housing that we're kind of off the table in total. Um, I just think that we need to get some clarification ourselves on how he's counting those properties because we wouldn't want to agree to give you guys something and then go back to our client and he, he defines duplexes very differently than yes. us. Okay, so you said originally it was off the table. Now you're saying it's not off the table? Oh, I was suggesting that we that we not consider them uh, in our calculation for today, but that we go back to our client and then perhaps come back and discuss the duplexes uh, with clarification on what that means to our client. Yeah, and I think maybe you all might feel comfortable and maybe your client might feel comfortable. We have about 36 minutes left. If we can reach an agreement on the eight total units, not including the duplexes, mm -hmm. I think we're very comfortable creating an agreement in principle, including the duplexes. Mm -hmm. We just don't want to have to blow up the deal by thinking, oh, this wasn't ever what he meant when he did the duplexes. So let's try to get to the eight without them. And then if we have time, I'm 100% comfortable. We're 100% comfortable doing an agreement in principle, including them. Okay. Okay. So you guys want those eight total units. We've shared that the eight total units would be lower total occupancy. So we'd be looking at, I think in the way you guys are thinking of it, some of the one bedroom or two bedrooms. Mm -hmm. okay. So how does it land with you all for those eight total units for those lower property, those lower size properties, smaller properties? Well, I mean, anything is better than nothing. But again, we were hoping for the four bedroom or three bedroom houses. So, you know, the more of those, the better. So I see that, you know, there's three, four bedroom units that have, you know, eight people per unit. We were hoping to, you know, capture all three of those, but it doesn't sound like that would be a possibility today. Would your client be willing to offer two of those eight occupancy uh, units? I want to take a step back. We could offer several of the larger ones. You would just get less total units. Okay. And so if there are, for example, are only three, that's why I was like grounding us sort of in that eight number so we can try to reach that eight. But it sounds like you all are, let me, let me take a step back. What's more important, more units or the larger units? Here, I can take that one. Sure. So a part of our goal, which I think we had shared earlier, is about maintaining families, right? And families tend to be larger than just two people, which okay. is why um, our client is not primarily interested in the one bedroom apartments now. However, the goal, the overall arching goal is to house as many people as possible, right? Mm -hmm. um, the intention that we have with that is just to keep us many families together. So for example, if the numbers break down with, you know, five of the larger units, but we house, where we're able to actually house more people, then fewer units is okay. Because the goal here is to just, you know, create a home away from home for as many people as possible. Okay, so it does sound like the eight total units is not, I just want to, I, I think if we're going to progress the conversation as quickly as possible and make sure we're having a good use of our client's time, we probably need to like decide on a variable and move every other variable around it. So it doesn't sound like the eight total units is probably the best metric. It sounds like you all want to start with maybe some of the larger size properties. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, I think we would need to start for us with one or two of the large properties and maybe this maybe we shift this into a conversation of securing housing for one large family because that's how it would maybe break down in the brain just based on the, the type of occupancy if we're talking about eight people um or maybe not necessarily one family but like eight people in one of these units or 16 if we have total of two units or something like that 
But it does sound like for you all, correct me if I'm wrong, I might be misreading this. It sounds like the eight is not the best place where you all want to start. So just to make sure, so you said one or two, did you mean that the conversation would now be about one or two units? One or two of the larger units. Okay, so one or two of the larger eight. Okay, but then there could still be other units as well, like in the total, right? Is that correct? No. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm okay. just trying to. I think I'm just trying to figure out what matters the most to you all, so that we can sort of start moving other variables around it because we keep shifting the main variable, and so it's hard for. I feel like it's hard for us to get some traction. Yeah, I can totally answer that question. Just to be with like you know provide absolute clarity to you. Um, our main variable here is to house as many people as possible to create a home for as many people as possible, right? Um, that's it. That's like the biggest goal here. Um, that's what they have the conversation with the company about. So it's like to us, it's not so much about which type of unit. Okay. Um, it's just how can we maximize the homes that we're providing to people. What's, what's your understanding, if you if you have any information on this, of the average size of a family that you're trying to house? Uh, because you you said a family is more than one, more than one, about eight. What, what is a number that you would be like ideally looking at if you were just housing like a standard number? Because eight is a is a large family, and you won't be able to house if you give one or two units more than just those one or two. So what's the other size that you're looking for? Are you looking for more than two, or are you solely interested in six or higher? What's the size you're trying to house? Um. So the first part of your question I'll address as far as like how big the average family is that's coming over. It's kind of hard to say, especially okay. with refugees. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people unfortunately have to come by themselves. A lot of people come with neighbors or family. It's just very, very sad situation. Um, as far as looking at solely one type of unit, that's, we're looking for a combination to be able to provide, you know, if someone comes by themselves versus if someone comes with their family. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm trying to think of the best way to do it. I know this numbers game is confusing, especially for lawyers. You know, we're not here to do math, but today we're here to do math. Yeah, so. exactly. We're we're gonna do it today. We're gonna push through for our client and for that common goal, creating home away from home and providing housing for these refugees. Okay. So let's just talk about a possible combination of units that you would be able to provide. Could you give us an example? Say like. We could do one of the eight occupancy units and we could do two of these. Could you just share more on your number? Yeah, I think I like the one number you just shared out. I think that's something we could definitely put on the table. You said one of the larger eight occupancy. Yes. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get this. We have eight total, we have one larger. Mm -hmm. And for us, I, I think Amber shared this for us larger means like the six plus units. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we can agree on that definition for today's conversation, just to make sure that we're all on the same page when we talk about larger occupancy units. Okay, so thank you for throwing that number one out on the table. We think that we can definitely offer one of the larger units that house six plus people. I think it gets to Amber's question, maybe something we don't, you know, we just don't have all the information our clients do. We don't know how large the average family is, so we do know maybe for one, we're keeping one full family together, and with this type of crisis, that's no small thing. So it sounds like we at least have one of the larger six person units out of that eight total. How do you all feel about then us making the other units smaller? Um, and when you say smaller, which sizes are you referring? I know we said four and below, but what would the combination of those units be? Let's look at these two person occupancy and four person occupancies okay. at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm starting there because something that's going to be important to our client, if I'm looking at that next column for the weekly rent, the two occupancy and the four occupancy on the bottom, the one bedroom and the two bedroom, have a lower rent and something he'll feel good about, especially sacrificing one of those larger properties that might happen during a tour season and might not, he'll feel better knowing, okay, well, at least for these two and four person occupancies, those are, those are my lower rent. Okay. So I see that you have four available four occupancy units at the bottom, like the two bedroom house or the two bedroom apartment. So how many of those would he be willing to volunteer? Um, in principle, that would agree on the subsidies, but I think something we could put on the table is two of the two person occupancies and two of the four person occupancies. Here, oh, here you go. 
fix. Yeah. Okay. So you said two two person and two four person. Yes. Okay. Cool. So two. And Ananya, while you're up there, for clarity, could we agree, since we're like getting into specific uh, housing unit type, yeah. could we put for that first one, one of the four bedroom houses? For the large one? Yes. Yeah. Um, we, is that okay with you guys? Yeah, that's how we understood it. Thank you okay. for clarifying. And then for this, this is the one bedroom house, and then this is the two bedroom house? Yes. Okay. And then I'm about to ask you to do something very annoying. Um, because you said two bedroom house, it would actually be the two bedroom apartment. Okay. These are the apartments. Um, just to make sure we clarify, because I know we shared about the importance of that weekly rent and being able to hold on to the higher rent properties. And then this is the apartment as well. Yes. Great. Thank you for changing that. No, or, I totally appreciate you um, pointing that out. So this currently brings us to five properties. Mm -hmm. The other remaining three, can we discuss those being potentially the larger occupancy units? Just to get to the number of eight, or are we not talking about eight at all? I don't think it could be the higher occupancy units. Um, okay. I think it might need to be, I don't know, Amber, what are you thinking about sort of increasing the number of the apartments? Um, I, let, I want to try to get to eight so that we can then get to subsidy and sort of start having to decrease numbers if we have to. Um, Amber, what are you thinking about increasing the number of two bedroom apartments or the one bedroom apartment? Um, so I'm thinking so, that the, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm thinking that the one bedroom apartment is one of the cheaper rent options. So again, our client might be happier with that. Um, so if we maybe want to increase the number of the one bedroom apartments and that will maybe bring us up to the eight, then I think we can start getting on the subsidies. Well, you know, the great thing about being here today is the subsidy, we would be providing that missed rent to Mr. Sagan, which mm. is why we were hoping to discuss another large occupancy unit because we could subsidize that unit and give him any lost profits that he would be incurring. So if we could get another large occupancy unit up there, we could agree that that would be one that we would subsidize. What well, can we do one of the two bedroom houses with the four person occupancy unit? Because that is a larger rent item for our client and if it's subsidized, it still honors our client's desire to not offer too many large scale properties. But if there's that subsidy, then it's their houses. So people are staying together, they're not apartments. So can we, should we, would you like one of the two bedroom houses to be on the table? And then it sounds like, I'd like maybe a little S near it since we're saying that those would definitely need to be subsidized. Yeah. Um well, I keep hearing rent coming up as, you know, something as a concern. Well, we were hoping to do one of the three or four bedroom because we had some information that Mr. Fagan's uh, units typically aren't get rented out year round. So we were hoping by subsidizing one of those larger units, we would be able to provide him with that stable rent. You know, if we're doing, like you said, I believe you said 10 months was a reasonable time to allow these properties to be used, that would be 10 months of subsidized rent that he would be receiving, guaranteed. And that would kind of allocate that risk for him of, well, I want to keep these larger units open. Um, that would take away that risk because he knows that he would be receiving rent for that. I like the way you're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. It's not the way our client's thinking about it, though. Um, something that Amber and I were talking about. So these properties bring in more than a million dollars a year and so for our client it's not necessarily just about the rent it's also about if people try to go rent the properties and they're unavailable will they never try again and so it's more than just for example the rent for those instances also some context we know you were sharing that the the units aren't always occupied that's definitely true these are it's a seasonal town it's a tourist resort however he does want the units to be available for tourists when they can be available and so I, I want to say candidly, and I, I'm sorry I had to preface all this with that, if we offered another larger unit, it would certainly need to be subsidized and it would be for significantly less time. Okay. When you say significantly less time, what are we talking? Um, we know that for you all, you said the number 10 months. It would not be 10 months. It, it might be something like three months. Okay. Um, but in honoring what you were saying, it wouldn't be the 10. It would need to be subsidized and it would be for significantly less time. Now, we know that that's against the goal. The goal is to house as many as, as many people for as long as possible. I think we can honor that if we start with this two-bedroom house 
bring us up to the eight number, and then start talking about subsidies. I mean, I, I see your point, but at the same time, I, I have a clarifying question. So you said that his properties make more than $1 million a year. Mm -hmm. Is that at the current rate they're being rented out, or is that if all of his properties were at full occupancy year round, they would be making more than $1 million? Even not at full occupancy, he's making a minimum of $1 million a year. Okay, yeah. thank you for that. That number does move, of course, as um, the seasons change, but at a minimum, that's how much the properties are generating. So again, it's not just a question of getting the rent. It's also a question of will people think of his name when they come back because the property was available and they had a good time. Um, and so again, I want to push us to, I know you guys, we have let the conversation sort of be controlled around this eight number that you guys threw out. We like that we're honoring that. Can we get one of these or some of these two bedroom houses on the table that will be subsidized um, just so that we can reach the number eight so we can sort of progress the conversation forward. Absolutely, I can address that. So I think part of the reason why we're, um, you know, maybe not jumping at the two bedroom option is we, as we've explained, is our goal is to house families. That's how we create a home away from home for all these people. Um, I can, however, address a little bit of something that you've mentioned twice is about, you know, he's concerned about will people not look him up in the future, right? Will people not know that his properties are available for renting if he's volunteering them up um, or if we're subsidizing them? So we can take care of that concern um, because, um, you know, EF management, as you said, has, I think, a total of 21 properties listed with Home Love. Um, what we can do is after this, I know we've talked about 10 months so far. I know three months was thrown out, but we'll, I'm just gonna talk about the 10 months. Um, for whatever duration that we agree upon, once these properties have been, you know, um, ha are like housing refugees, after that, when he relists them again as rentals, um, what we'll do on our end is refigure our algorithm to show his properties towards the top of the list for any time someone searches Maltopia, right? So this kind of takes care of the result, like this kind of takes care of the concern of you know, maybe other renters not finding his properties or things like that, right? So, by this way, it's technically a temporary loss, maybe, but it's going to be a whole lot of future gains, right? Mm, that's a that, that's something we were talking about. I like that. How long would that um, how long would that algorithm change on our for our client? Yeah, that's a really great question. That's something that we can work out, and we're hoping for at least three months. I mean, we want to really spotlight Mr. Fagan for being such a kind and giving person, you know, not many people are willing to sit at the table and discuss, you know, volunteering or subsidizing their properties. So we would spotlight him at the top of the page for Moldovia. Um, we could also look into the possibility of, you know, like Airbnb has commercials. Home Love is wanting to start doing commercials as well. And we would love to talk about how Mr. Fagan offered up his properties. We can show Look at Home Love and this property owner helping refugees together. And just to clarify, because we do like where this is going, are these, for example, the commercials, are these ideas in the works, or are these guarantees that would be put in the agreement we signed today? No, I think these are guarantees that we could discuss with our client. I mean, it's a really great solution to thank Mr. Fulian for his kindness. Um, one thing regarding the subsidies, though, it's just an issue of kind of keeping the bad actors away. We would want Mr. Fagan to sign an NDA, um, not telling people that he was receiving a subsidy for the housing. Now, he could publicize that he was volunteering his housing, but we're concerned if the word gets out that Home Love is offering the subsidies, that people will just start to be in it for the money. And, you know, so far we've had over 4,000 people volunteer their homes. But we're afraid if, you know, like we said, people find out that we're subsidizing, everyone's going to jump in and be doing this for the wrong reason. And we want people to still be motivated to volunteer their homes. So would he be willing to sign an NDA regarding the subsidized properties? In principle, I, I don't think it sounds like a bad idea. Mm -hmm. I do want to own it. These ancillary <laughs> things are very important. So your client, I'm sure they're very important to ours as well. But I feel like before we finish and start, talk about these ancillary things, I think I, I want to get back to the total units in the houses because I know we still have a lot to cover, but in principle, those sound like really good ideas. So. Um, yeah, I agree. And, you know, I think that that's um, 
that is a, a really interesting ancillary thing, but we've gotten away um, from, from some of the harder numbers of the circumstance. And I think, again, it's kind of because just listening, it sounds like everything that we say is contingent on what you say, what you say is contingent on what we say. So every time we we're trying to like dance, we're just sort of going in a circle. Um, essentially, the more higher occupancy units your client wants, the fewer units he's going to get. Right. That's just put that out there. Um, there are only three higher occupancy units that our client would even be prepared to offer you in the sense that only three slots of the eight could be higher occupancy. Now, the, the feature about that that is important is that if you chose to have only those three, it would be those three. You would essentially only get three properties. Uh, you wouldn't be able to house any um, you know, single mother or uh, single gentleman uh, type you could, of, you, I mean, you could, but they would all just be together in this one place instead of keeping you know, them sort of separate. Um, if you wanted to do one higher occupancy house, we can give you more of the smaller units. Do you want houses specifically or would you be interested in apartments? Because it would seem to me like if you were trying to keep people closer together, as a solution to not necessarily having them all be in one unit, you could potentially look at the apartments um, with a little more interest because you know they're in one little duplex with each other. They're in one apartment. Um, do you have a preference between houses and apartments? No, I mean, like you guys said, we're focused on occupancy. So apartments are amenable to us. Okay. So let's discuss that. Well, yeah. So I know we were trying to get to that total number of eight. I said the two bedroom houses that we sort of slid into. Mm -hmm. Well, remember, there's the subsidy for the rents. Thank you for putting the subsidy back into the forefront of our mind. Do we want to add some more of the two? Do we want to add the other two to the two bedroom apartments to get us to that total of four? Um, that gets us to seven. Yes. The left part right there. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be good to see it up on the board. That way we can do the mental math and see how that turns out. Uh, I think that might be a good idea. So that brings us to seven total units. I yes. did have a question. Wait, um, what if, sorry, since you're up there, do we just want to add one more of the one bedroom? So three, so, one, three, four. That gets us to the eight. Okay. One, three, four. Great. Mm -hmm. So this brings me to my question, and it's something you mentioned as well. Um, so earlier you had said three total units, which would be the larger occupancy units, right? And then with also what we have currently up on the board, are we talking for all of these being volunteered, those three total units just being fully volunteered, and also these eight? Or what's kind of the math on how many will be subsidized? We're Definitely looking for some of that. for eight total units. That's a lot of units. We're looking for some subsidization. I don't want to hide the ball on that. Can we know that one in NDA is very important to you guys in terms of the subsidy? So it sounds like you guys have put some considerable thought into the subsidy. Can you give us a window or a range of how much subsidy for the eight properties? I think we've come across the table and saying you guys want eight. Let's try to make eight happen. We have eight right there right now. Can you all talk to us now about a window for subsidy? Yeah, so just to move on to the subsidy question, we do need a hard answer on the NDA that we post because we can't really get into the subsidy question without first addressing the NDA. If there is no NDA, it would you know, endanger us to all of those things that Libby mentioned earlier, and we really can't progress. You need an, sorry, do you need an NDA from us to not discuss what's going on at the table because we might not agree to certain subsidy amounts, or if you say right now you need an NDA from our client? We need an NDA from both you and your client about the fact that we've discussed subsidies, right? So it's not that like whatever number of subsidies, that's definitely we don't want that information disclosed. We also don't want any information disclosed about home love subsidizing units, period. We're saying if units are subsidized and NDA would be signed, that would say you're not going to discuss the subsidy. Um, we might need to step out and call our client. Let's put the agreement in principle on the table for an NDA. I, my only thought is they had to talk at the coffee shop and they talked about subsidies and it didn't seem like an NDA was needed then. So let's say yes in principle. Because um, that, yeah. just in full transparency, that is contingent today. Mm -hmm. That is a requirement. Um, you know, 
since the coffee talk, we've obviously, our clients spoken to different people who've spoken to us. And we mm-hmm. just think it's a great thing to prevent, like I said, against bad actors. Um, right. And you, you guys are still getting the publicity. We're still going to spotlight him and look at the commercial, things like that. So it doesn't seem to pose any real threat to your client. Yeah. Okay. Let's do the NDA. I think we can, I'll put a check mark on that. Let's do the NDA. Um, I think you're right. Sometimes our clients, when they talk to a lawyer, they realize maybe they said some things that yeah. should have gotten signed confidentiality first. Um, so, okay, if we have an NDA, can we get a window on the subsidy? Right. Um, yes, we definitely can. That is contingent on how many volunteer units. So if you could give us how many of these units could be volunteered, we could possibly, you know, look at taking a break to come back and give you um, – the number of subsidy and how much we would be willing to pay for those subsidized units just in the interest of time. I would definitely like it to take a break. I do want to acknowledge, I asked the question of, can I get a window? I was told yes, if we agreed to the NBA. So we've agreed to the NBA and now I'm told, well, now I want to know how many are volunteered. So can we, it, it can be a wide range, but can we get a range on the subsidy so that we have some understanding? Are you concerning about? like monetary amount or the yes. number of, okay. Um, well, like I said, the two are directly correlated. So we have a range depending upon how many units were volunteered. So I can't give you an answer that, you know, if I say, oh, our high end was this amount, I can't, you can't come back in and ask for that high amount if you're only volunteering like one property. Um, well, I think that there's a bit of good faith on both sides here. Um, we're not trying to get anything over on your client, and we don't think that your client's trying to get anything over on ours or us or anybody mm-hmm. at this table. If you give us a range, um, it would be unreasonable for us to try to take advantage of that range if we're just going to be volunteering absolutely everything. Um, but giving us a range gives us an opportunity to get our feet on the ground on what we can do. To, to smooth this process over. Because right now, we've offered you a lot of things in terms of, well, this is something we can do, this is something we can do, but we have no information for, for what we can do now, what we can do next, how we can move this along. Okay, so yeah, let me just also recap all, everything that we've talked about right because I know it's been close to an hour and there's been a lot of topics, and I know they're all interrelated to each other, and I understand um, on your point and what Libby was responding, and I'll also clarify that at the end of the summary. So just to make sure what we've talked about is um, the amount of units. So currently we have on the board 10 units. Uh, we do have um, eight, right? eight, sorry, eight units, oh my gosh. Okay. Um, and you know, it's that amount, I didn't realize it was that bad amount. Um, so we have the, the one, um, three of the one bedrooms, which would be six people total. We have four of, the two bedrooms, which would be 16 people total, and then we have one of the larger occupants, which, which we have have we firmed it up to be the four bedroom house, as it says over there. Is that okay? Great. So that's eight people as well. Um, and then we have talked about the 10 month time, but we've also thrown out the three month number. We haven't yet fully agreed on what that would look like, and then we we have agreed on the NDA. Um, I think that covers everything. Let me know if I missed. Yeah, we. You said the subsidy conversation. Yeah, I just I, I I know we don't have a lot of time. We agreed on the NDA because you said you'd give us a window. Right, so I'm going to that. Absolutely. And you're completely correct. So part of why Olivia was asking about the numbers of these units that will be volunteered is because the way that the subsidy would work is, to, so okay, for example, let's pick a four-bedroom house, okay? okay. So, um, or whatever, what are we saying here? Okay, four-bedroom house, or $2,000, right? Let's say. So it's... For example, if that's the unit that gets subsidized, that's a higher number of subsidy that we pay for it because it's a larger unit that um, has more people, right? For example, if you volunteer the two bedroom houses, then the subsidy number would change. So really what Libby and I are trying to get at here is that we need to know which of these units we volunteer and which will be subsidized so we can give you those subsidy numbers. Does that help? It does. Okay. Great. For our client, the number of units that are volunteered is based on the subsidy. Okay. Well, Which is why I was excited when okay. once you said you would give us that range, once we agreed to an NDA, it was because I was like, oh, okay, perfect. Like, this is something that's so important to our client. We're going to agree to the NDA. He's going to sign it. We'll get that range. But it now seems like that's not the case. It seems like we're not going to get the range unless we tell you how many we're volunteering. Um, yeah. 
Well, yeah, we just thought coming into this, the original discussion was between our clients about how many units would be volunteered. We knew this was volunteering going into it, so we didn't know that was going to be such a contentious point. That's not something that you guys would be willing to share up front with us. Um, so maybe now would be a good time to take a break and we can come back maybe with an offer um, of how many units would be subsidized versus volunteered since that seems to be something that you guys can't outright say. Maybe we can work out some numbers and then come back in about five minutes or so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you guys.
Jamie, can you hear us? Yes. Great. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you for a very short break. Um, we had a chance to discuss everything and come up with a number for you guys. Um, I know we were kind of put in an awkward situation given the fact that we had to uh, kind of estimate how many properties your client would be willing to volunteer, but we've come up with the following option package for you guys. And this would be in addition to the NDA, um, the commercial and the algorithm for three months that we've discussed previously. Um, we would be willing to subsidize three of the units. Um, and since you've mentioned rent as a concern for the larger occupancy, we would be willing to subsidize the four bedroom house. This would be for a period of 10 months. Um, and you, we would let you guys choose the other two units that you would like to be subsidized, but the total subsidy amount would be $150,000. And all of these terms would be for 10 months. Um, if you're wanting more of a subsidy amount, we can discuss looking at more units, but I know that we are out of time today. So maybe we could just table this discussion, take it back to your client, and if you guys have availability, say on Tuesday afternoons, we could get it on the calendar to pick up this discussion. But yeah. um, we'll be getting something on the calendar. Yeah. Okay. Thank you guys for your time today. Thank you. I'm sorry we couldn't come to an agreement, but we appreciate working with y'all. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great. Okay, thanks guys. So what we'll do is um, you guys get your 10 minute break. So if you guys want to um, head out and then you're gonna uh, come back, you guys are gonna start, team A will start. Um, I know also just so you guys are aware, um, this is the first part of the competition where um, the self-evaluation will be scored. I do think I mentioned that yesterday. Danielle, just so you know as well, because the score sheet does not mention it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks guys. And for everybody on Zoom, I'm just going to mute it until they return. Thank you so much.
question in the back. All right, thank you. So just to refresh everyone, we are Team A. My name is Libby Spam, and this is Ananya Takavetti. Um, so today we're just going to be recapping our round by discussing first our strategy, what we would have done the same, and what we would have done differently. I'm just going to start by discussing our strategy, and then I'll let Ananya talk about what we would have done the same and differently. So our strategy going into this round was to really push our theme, which was creating a home away from home. We knew from the fact pattern that we had a common goal of providing housing to refugees. So we wanted to work that in there to show that we had a common goal. This doesn't have to be contentious and just to keep us on track of working together. Um, because we know that with the subsidies, you know, things sort of got confusing with the terms and just dropping that in there, I think helped rework us back on a common path. Um, another of our strategies was to set the agenda with our three interests, which were maximizing units, duration, and goodwill. Um, obviously, units and duration were our big key terms there, so we wanted to let them know that those were important to us, and it sounded like those were good common terms that they were able to build off of and kind of structure the conversation. And our final part of our strategy was just to ask a lot of information gathering questions. That way we could make them justify what they were asking for. And our hope was our opening question of saying, well, why does Mr. Fagan want to volunteer his properties? Was to show, okay, we'll see, he wants to volunteer, so maybe we aren't so motivated by money. Um, with that being said, I'll let Anonya tell you a little bit more. Yeah, thanks for that, Libby. So some of the things that we would have done the same is, um, you know, continue to ask them for justifications to really just understand what their actual position is, really understand their reasoning. Um, and then also something that we liked when we did this round that we would want to do in a future round is offer creative solution. So, you know, the reworking the algorithm, maybe publicizing them more, uh, you know, putting them on blogs, commercials, things like that, because it seems to address their rental um, income concern and kind of would be a longer term solution. Um, something that we would like to do differently is, um, you know, maybe follow the structure of the conversation a little bit more, maybe plan out all the little parts of the subsidies, things like that. Um, a lot of those terms just seem to get away from us, and we spent a lot of time just going back and forth. Um, I think something else that we would like to do differently is also mention the NDA earlier in the round, um, since we were short in time, but still talking about it back and forth, and maybe if we reordered you know, where it would fit with um, our three interests, then we could put it um, towards the top, just time structurally. Um, with that, I think some of the interests that we understood that was their interest, which they were on the board, was reasonable approach and sustainable solution. Um, again, we hope that it, it had come to it, but I guess their bad note would have been to maintain status quo and to continue renting out their properties and not offering them up for refugees at the resettlements. And, you know, coming in with the option, uh, option package at the end, it wasn't an ideal solution, but I think it did give us a good place to put a pin in the conversation. Say, here's what we've offered, uh, since they weren't being upfront with how many uh, properties they were willing to volunteer. We were saying, unfortunately, we're going to have to decide for you. You can take this option package back to your client you guys can mark it up and then that's a good starting place for our discussion next time so we weren't just stuck in the same like hole together um hopefully that will provide us with a good starting point yeah do you guys have any other questions for us yeah i was wondering as far as time management goes an organization um what do you think you would do next time to progress the conversation along so that you were able to kind of reach reach your other interests earlier um i can take this one so I think that offering an option package earlier could have been a good way to do that because the terms were very ambiguous as far as going back and forth the duration and how many properties. If we put some options up on the board, I think it would have been an easier starting point to work from there. They say, you know, actually we're not authorized to allow you guys to stay here for 12 months. We'd have to bring this down to 10 months. Um, and the chart could get confusing as well. So that would have provided more clarity, not just for us, but for everyone that was watching and for the judges as well. Okay, great. Any other questions? Yes. All right, well, thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, thank you so much. And we will go grab them and send them in. Great, yeah. thank you.
Should we take all our stuff with us or would we be back in here? Um, you'll be back in a little bit. Okay. Great. And Danielle, I'm so sorry, but if you want to ask questions, you obviously can. <laughs> Thanks. I'm good, but you okay. got it. <laughs> You're ready. Okay. The composition rules lay out two questions for us to answer. First, if we have to do the round all over again, or will we do the same? The second, if we have to do the round all over again, what would we do differently? Before we get into what we'll do the same and what we will do the different, what we would do differently, I'll briefly explain the deal that was proposed. Um, my name is Autumn Brehan. This is my co-counsel partner, Amber Keating. And so while we were in the round, the agreement that was proposed by opposing counsel was that there'd be an NDA agreement on the discussion of the subsidy. Um, that was contingent on us getting a window of the subsidy. They proposed three months of out an algorithm that would push our advertising to the top to cover any potential lost rents. They offered a $150,000 subsidy on the properties with one of those automatically going towards the largest unit and the others going to the smaller units of our choosing. If we had time to structure the deal, we maybe would have chosen the largest rent units. And then there was a discussion about the 10 months versus three months, but that was the agreement that was proposed. We did not get a chance to respond based on the timer, but that's the agreement that was at least offered. And with that, I'll allow my co-counsel partner, Amber Keating, to explain what we did well and what we could change. Thank you. Um, one thing that we did well was that we didn't budge on demanding an answer for the subsidy. Um, opposing counsel said that if we signed an NDA, they would give us a window on the subsidy. Um, but then when we agreed to sign the NDA, they then said that they needed to know how many units we were prepared to volunteer. Um, our facts made the number of units that we were prepared to volunteer contingent on receiving an answer on the subsidy. So we couldn't negotiate against ourselves or our client um, by agreeing to that, given that they moved the ball after we agreed to sign the NDA. Another thing that we did well was we were always prepared to untangle the web. There were a few points where it got very jumbled in terms of facts and interests and numbers. And we tried to define terms. Um, we tried to set variables. We tried to refocus the conversation um, and create a point at which we could springboard and make some traction and get somewhere. Um, two things that we would change. One is um, we might've wanted to, to uh, start with packages. Um, at certain points, our side was a business. And in trying to seem invested in what Home Love was trying to do, we leaned toward the altruistic. We should have been more structured toward um, uh, structure, essentially, um, getting somewhere in terms of the numbers and the, the things that we could actually offer and meeting what they needed um, based on what we had. And then another thing is speaking balance. Um, my partner and I uh, had a sort of interesting dynamic. She um, sort of throws out the, the things that we can offer and I'm in the back sort of looking at the paper and thinking, can we offer this? Are we able to do this? Um, and in a round, that speaking dynamic might seem off, but um, that was what we decided to do so that we could keep the numbers and everything straight. And with the last around minute and 50 seconds, we'd love to take questions from the judges if there are any. Interesting, you guys had a full 10 minutes. I think the clock started earlier than that. So you guys, you have plenty of time. Um, did you have any questions? Um, did you have a, any option packages prepared um, to go into it and you were just waiting until they gave you the subsidy number or had you not prepared those and you were gonna use the break to do that? We had option packages prepared. It seemed like the way that the problem was designed, not to break the fourth wall, but it seemed like the way that the problem was designed is that we couldn't get the information we needed from them unless we gave certain variables. 
but we weren't authorized to give those variables unless we had certain information from them. I think maybe that's where the crux of the subsidy started to break down. Our facts, as Amber stated, were very clear to not share how much we were willing to volunteer unless we got that subsidy number. And so at some point, it seemed like we might be negotiating against ourselves if we start putting packages out there because we really needed to know that number for the subsidy, which is why we try to start the round with the subsidy. And maybe we, I think to Amber's point, should have maybe a little more forcefully tried to go back. Um, and I was wondering, so I know that you guys had pretty early on come up with this eight total units number. Um, do you have uh, like your own strategy or reasoning why you kind of let them anchor to eight? Um, yeah, that was more me. In, in given how um, uncertain it seemed like they were when we kept asking them, well, what is important to you? What do you want? What are your interests? It kind of kept shifting. So um, I knew that our client was prepared to offer eight. So I decided to just say, okay, there are a total of eight units that are available. The proportion of larger occupancy units to smaller occupancy units is not going to exceed that eight. Um, I was just trying to put a number out there so that we could actually start filling slots and making decisions about what could go where. Okay, great. Danielle, did you have any questions? Sorry, she's on Zoom. No, it's okay, I don't. I think you both covered them. Okay, great. Thank you. Should I bring guys. any other? Um, no, so what we're going to I'll leave this for everybody. Um, so the judges are actually going to tabulate score sheets. Um, what you'll do then is we'll come grab you guys and your coaches. We're ready to announce the break. We want, or I'm sorry, um, the, the winners of the competition. Um, once that's done, or we are going to announce that on YouTube Live. So anyone who is there, we are going to announce it. Um, and then we're basically going to get it off YouTube Live when we do critique. And that way, too, your judges will be able to talk as well if they have any feedback since they were here the whole time. And we're all U of H, so. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Thank you.
Okay, great. Thanks everybody for coming back. Um, we were just letting everybody know um, kind of what we're going to be doing next. We are going to be announcing um, this year's um, champions for the intro team, University of Houston Law Center ADR intro team competition. Um, we thank you guys so much for your time um, and talent and for coaching. Um, so for all of those watching, um, just so you're aware, what happened was we did announce the break yesterday. So these teams really only had yesterday evening to read through this fact pattern and to prepare. So they may not have gotten as far this fact pattern before today. Um, and they do have a limited amount of time with the facts. So we do just like to point that out for people uh, because you don't have a few weeks going into this. And so they had to work really hard um, late last night, I'm sure early this morning as well. Um, and we were also talking about the fact that um, for the first time ever, University of Houston has been named the ABA competitions champion. So congratulations. We actually have some of our national finalists from last year in here. Um, we do have both Autumn and Libby, we're our uh, national finalists for ABA client counseling. And then you cannot see him, but Colin Robinson is sitting in the back. He's one of our coaches this year, and he was um, at nationals for ABA arbitration. Um, so thank you guys for that as well. And congratulations to our entire team. Um, I'd like to give a round of applause. I'm sorry for the noise and feedback. We'll do like quiet rounds of applause for your coaches. <laughs> and thank you guys so much for being here. Um, our coaches volunteer their time. They volunteer their time, their talent, their experience and knowledge with our um, teams. And our goal as a program is really to promote you guys um, to be better attorneys. That is you know, what we hear about most importantly. Um, so with that, and without further ado, um, we will announce the champions this year. Um, both teams did phenomenally well. We're so impressed. Um, you guys have so many strengths, and uh, we're going to talk about those in a little bit off camera. Um, but so did you have anything you wanted to say, Madison, before? Um, no, I think everybody did a really great job, especially with um, just finding out about the problem last night. And I'm happy to get to watch you guys. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, so this year's inter-team winners are going to be Team A. <laughs> it's going to be Libby and Ananya, so, so congratulations. Um, it was a close call. I will let you know. I don't mean to detract. So it was, we have three judges. It was not unanimous, um, but we do have our winning team, so I wanted you guys to know. So obviously, it was, it was pretty well-rounded. Um, so everybody did a fabulous job, and we're um, going to now go have some fun and talk to the teams and maybe uh, do something uh, fun and non ADR related after this. So thank you, everybody who's watching. We really appreciate it, um, and we are going to let you all go. Thank you so much.